Hi, I'm Mike Aben, and welcome to episode 8 of my beta campaign. Let's see, what do we have today? Today we have, we have our first jet plane. That'll be exciting. But before we get to any of that, we do have to finally finish off our COM satellite network. So what we have here is COMSAT-3 finishing off its circularization burn. Um, this particular uh, launch was just a normal ascent, not the steep ascents that you've been seeing with my other communication satellites because I do have enough now to get, oh, I'd say, about 90% coverage in low curve in orbit. So I'm going into a, an orbit of about 80 kilometers. And uh, then once we finish off that orbit, it's time to set up a maneuver. Now, we're going to do a transfer up to an altitude of 1,067.5 kilometers. So we're going to set up the maneuver. And the thing to do is to take note of how much time it's going to take you to get up there. So you can see up there at Apoapsis, it's going to take about 45 minutes. But don't forget to subtract off. Uh, the amount of time it's going to take you to get to the maneuver node. So we take a look at that and we see that's about nine and a half minutes. So I'm going to call that about 35 minutes, just over, a little over half an hour. Now remember that ComSat 1 and ComSat 2 have periods of two hours. So in half an hour, they're going to do one quarter of an orbit. And we want to position ComSat 3 so it is halfway between them. So, if we think about this, if we aim our, uh, the apoapsis of our burn, so it's a little bit ahead of either ComSat 1 or ComSat 2, and we burn at that point, then in the amount of time it would take us to get up to altitude, ComSat 1 or ComSat 2, it doesn't matter which one we aim for, we'll do a little over a quarter of an or, or yeah, a little over a quarter of an orbit, and we will be positioned roughly halfway between them. Now the thing you're going to need to do is as you time warp towards your node, you need to keep advancing that node as well, right? Because that 35 minutes doesn't take into account the time to get to the node. So uh, this takes a little bit of playing around, time warping and then advancing the node, but Precise Node makes this uh, quite a bit easier with its time tools to, to, to advance the node. And uh, at, at one point I had to actually switch over to the other of the two comsats to aim at because of the way things are working out. I ended up losing contact at one point, but pretty soon I was set to go. So here we are doing our burn, um, and I can see it didn't time out quite as I want. My uh, The communication satellite that I'm going for is a little too close to my apoapsis that I would have liked. So I'm likely to end up a little bit behind, but this is not a big deal. Remember, we can always put ourselves into a, a period that's a little bit under two hours and just let ComSat 3 catch up. And here we are time warping up towards Apoapsis watching the communication links form and disappear between the various satellites we have now in orbit and as we approach Apoapsis it is very clear that yes my, uh, my satellite is behind and needs to catch up. So after doing my circularization burn, I needed to do the counterintuitive thing of burning retrograde to speed myself up. Yes, that would lower my period and uh, allow ComSat 3 to travel faster than its neighboring satellites, and this will allow it to catch up and get into the position that I want it to be. And then I thought, you know, while we're waiting, why don't we tweak all of these orbits and get them as good as we can get them? So. I flipped over to ComSat 1 and I can see from Kerbal Engineer here that I have an inclination of 0 0.065 degrees and that's not bad but we can do better than that. And to get the inclination because you can't see the ascending and descending nodes right here is you need to pick something that has an inclination of zero and the perfect thing to pick is the moon. The moon has an orbit with an inclination of exactly zero and if you target the moon that gives you an ascending and descending nodes for the moon which is also the ascending and descending nodes for Kerbin. So all we have to do now is time warp to the nearest node. There's an ascending node coming up. So we're going to time warp up to that. I love the way these uh, relays worked right now. We're, we're actually relaying the signal from KSC all the way out to a satellite around the moon and then all the way back to uh, 
ComSat 1 here. But as we approach uh, that ascending node, we need to arrange ourselves, in this case, anti-normal because it is a descending node. So I need to flip the satellite around and aim it to the south. Make sure your thrust is really nice and low because these are going to be very, very fine-tuned adjustments. And just with a few little puffs, you can get that inclination down well, as low as you can. I like to get those first three digits after the decimal place to be zeros myself. And as we finish off this one, afterwards it's just a simple matter of popping over to the other satellites and doing the same thing. Now besides the communitrons, each of these satellites have two directional antennas. And uh, I'm going to take one from ComSat 3 and then another one from ComSat 4 once I get it up there and point it at Minmus. And I took one from each of ComSat 1 and ComSat 2 and pointed those directional antennas at the moon. And that will get me communication coverage out to those bodies without having to do further antenna adjustments in the future. Um, each of them then has a spare directional antenna that I will use to point at any particular crafts or satellites that I have uh, in other places within the Kerbin system. All right, now it's on to our first jet. Now, I, I spent a bit of time in the past talking about rockets and how to design them so that they're stable, so I think it deserves some attention to talk about planes because they are a little bit different. And the first thing I want to talk about is the relationship between the center of mass and the center of lift. Mass being the big yellow dot and lift being the blue one. You want the center of lift to be just a little bit behind the center of mass, not way behind like they are in rockets, just a little bit behind. And you can adjust the lifting surfaces to get that lift where you need it to be. Um, if it's way behind, you're going to find that your plane wants to nosedive, and if it's ahead of it, you're going to find your plane wants to flip out. Now, the other thing you want to take a look at are the various control surfaces that you will have, and you want to tweak them. Now, NEAR allows you to adjust the deflection uh, amount of deflection, the max deflection, which is really useful to make the planes a little less twitchy. You also want to adjust what aspects of flight they control. So these aileons on the wings, you want to control roll. The elevators on the tail, you want to control pitch. The rudder, you want to control yaw. And then finally, it's often helpful on planes to put these canards up at the front to also help with pitch. And this will help taking off especially. It helps getting that plane off the runway. And speaking of taking off, you want to take a look at how the plane sits on the runway. Now, one thing you can do is actually just get it out there on the runway and see how it sits there, but you can actually sort of take a look in the space plane hangar as well by bringing it down so the wheels are just onto the ground. Um, you don't want it to be pitching forward or else you're going to have difficulty taking off. You, you want a slight up pitch is ideal or a neutral pitch like I have here is fine as well. And then finally the last thing is those rear landing gears, not the ones that are way at the back. Those, those are there just to keep the engine from hitting the bottom. The ones that are under the wings, you don't want them too far behind the center of mass because when the plane goes to take off it's going to pivot on those gears and if those gears are too far back you're going to have trouble taking off. And now we're off to see its first mission. This is the Aristarchus and our pilot, our newest Kerbinaut, uh, Tom Plock? Tom Plock? I think I like Tom Plock. I'm going to go with Tom Plock. And you know that any pilot that looks like this, you are in good hands. So we turn on our uh, landing lights and we throttle up and we're off going down this rather undulating highway. I mean, really, I think they could afford a greater to try and work down this runway. I'm pretty sure the grass to the side of the runway is smoother than that pile of sand that they have us taking off. But we are off anyway and things are going fine. So we have a couple of aerial survey contracts out there that we're gonna try and polish off with this uh, this jet. We'll also have, we have a little bit of science on it too. We'll get to that. But uh, so the thing to do is, is to pick which one to go for. I'm going to go for this nearest one and you want to set it as a target and that puts it onto your nav ball so that you can uh, 
turn to go. Now I know I gotta turn this thing, I'm pretty much going exactly the wrong way, so I'm gonna turn all the way around and keep on going till I get to see that uh, that icon come up on my nav ball. I'm starting to see it in there, so I wanna zero in. I'm also tweaking at the same time with the contracts to get the contracts available so that I can see what it is that I am supposed to do. And it was in reading over the contracts that I started to realize, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to land here. I'm supposed to do a surface EVA and a surface, uh, take a surface sample. Uh, I had not anticipated that. I, I wasn't trying to make my first plane flight a flight in the dark. So I am very, very sorry, Tom Plock. Uh, this is turning out to be uh, a little bit of a riskier mission than I had originally anticipated. But, come on, just look at that mustache, right? Tom Plock and his mustache, we can get this done. And besides having to land in the dark, I do have another concern as well. At the time I uh, built, designed this and sent it off into the building queue, uh, I had not upgraded the sp space plane hangar. So I was limited to 30 parts, so I had to sacrifice a number of things that normally I would like to have on my plane. Number one, uh, were batteries. I have no batteries on this thing and I'm flying in the dark but I didn't expect to have to be landing and all that kind of stuff so as you'll see in a little bit uh, electricity becomes a little bit of an issue and the other thing I like to have on my planes are air brakes. Now I know air brakes aren't part of the stock uh, airplane parts um, but the stock air is is kinda like well I've heard it described as flying through soup and when you start putting in things like like uh, the near or the far uh, aerodynamics mods, uh, the, the air is a lot slipperier and trying to slow yourself down to a landing speed without air brakes, it's a little trickier. So well, what, 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 what can we do? We gotta see how we do. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be flying over to those, uh, uh, those, those two markers that we see there and uh, put her down there on the ground. So here we are coming up to our waypoint and I'm starting to notice that the ground that is behind me is a lot friendlier looking and flatter looking than the ground that seems to be ahead of me. So I think I would best be served by turning this around and landing the other way. Now that means I'm going to be a little bit further away from the uh, waypoint than I, you know, than, than would be ideal, but I think I'll just drive over the hills and get myself there. And here we are coming into our final approach. Have I mentioned the flying? I don't consider that really my strength. Uh, did, did you see that episode a few episodes ago? The, 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 the landing on the VAB, you know, the explosions and all that kind of stuff? Well, okay, well here we go. There's no turning back now. And touchdown. And you're probably realizing this is at about two times speed. Though at this point, it seems like I'm taking a long time to stop. I really do miss those air brakes. But uh, yeah, stop, I do. And then it's time to drive this beastie off to the waypoint. And over hill and over dale we go, and finally we do reach our destination to be able to perform our surface EVA. I am so glad I did not try to land in here. But, uh, now, we have invented the jet engine, we have invented rockets that have taken us to the moon, but we have yet to invent the most sophisticated device of all, which is the ladder. So Thon Plock actually can't put his feet down on the ground. But, that's not a problem. Standing on top of the vehicle, if you recall, does count as being on the surface. So if you climb up on top, you can take your uh, surface sample, you can take your surface EVA without any issues whatsoever. And after picking up a surface sample from Nerd Legacy Beta, 
it was time to get on to the third leg of this particular contract, which was to travel to Kiram's Twilight and obtain an altitude of 19,100 meters. And while we're blowing on out of here, let's talk a little bit about the name of this vessel. Aristarchus. Aristarchus is the third of my Greek names to use. In this particular Greek, was a 3rd century BC mathematician, astronomer, scholar, and all the rest. And this particular uh, Greek was known for his heliocentric model for the solar system. And although by no means the majority view at the time, there is every evidence to indicate that his model was something that was openly debated and openly discussed and he wasn't ostracized or ridiculed because of his belief that the sun was at the center of the universe. But, uh, you know, and if you compare that to what people like Galileo or Copernicus had to go through uh, millennia later, uh, having, trying to say the same thing that he was saying so much, so much earlier, um, you know, it's, it's quite sad to think that. Now, although the uh, Earth-centered, geocentric model uh, was the one that ended up winning out, it wasn't for frivolous reasons that, that people kind of leaned towards the geocentric model at the time. They had some good reasons for, for, for really having some serious doubts that the sun was at the center of the universe. Uh, the biggest one being the lack of what is known as parallax. If the Earth is moving around the sun, then we should be seeing the, the stars in the sky shifting their positions slightly uh, back and forth. And we call that parallax. And the astronomers of the time couldn't detect anything like that. So the conclusion you would have to draw is one, either the Earth doesn't move, or two, if the Earth does move, these stars must be an unfathomable distance away. And that was a little much for people to try and uh, swallow at the time. It was much, much seemed more logical that the Earth was stationary in the middle. Well, of course, that turned out to be wrong, but you can't exactly blame them for thinking that. And as we approach our waypoint, I think I need to uh, offer some words of explanation for the behavior about the witness. Um, there are two things I thought as I was approaching this particular part of the contract. Number one is I thought my engine would flame out at this altitude. Um, this is just the regular jet engine. I don't have anything special as far as air scoops go. They're just the basic ones you have at the beginning. So I thought this engine is not going to be getting enough oxygen at around 20 uh, thousand meters and it was going to flame out. So my idea was to actually pitch up, put this thing into a parabolic trajectory to get it over 20,000 meters, uh, switch the engine off, and then while I was up there I would pick up the, uh, the necessary part of this particular contract. And I ended up getting up there and then the contracts didn't go green on me, that element of the contract. And the reason why it didn't go green is because I didn't notice I had to take a crew report up here. So, you know, I was very baffled at this particular point, um, and it took me another try trying to get up to 19,000 or 20,000 meters, and uh, before I realized, oh, I need to take a crew report. You are probably also noticing I'm not exactly in control of this vessel right here. Once I was up at this altitude, uh, the control surfaces aren't doing anything because the air is so thin. And so, yeah, I kind of got some tumbling and bumbling going, but I did get control of the vessel again and pulled out of all of this stuff. Uh, and then it was just a matter of uh, realizing, wow, my engine didn't flame out, so I don't have to go through all of this kind of stuff. And so finally it was just a f straight out flight hate that crew report and I was able to polish off uh, the last part of this contract. You were probably noticing the electrical problems I was starting to have and to be honest I've yet to really wrap my head around it. Even with the engine at full thrust I was barely generating any electricity. If I wasn't at full thrust I was uh, losing electricity and by now my electricity was pretty much all gone. Um, I gotta take a look at the numbers as far as what electricity that engine generates and what electricity the uh, reaction wheels and command capsule actually use. Maybe that will make some sense to me. But uh, now it's just coming in for the landing. Uh, I was going quite fast, so I thought the best thing to do would be to uh, bypass uh, KSC like I did there, do a quick 
turn around and put her down on the runway. Yeah, I think I'll blame that landing on the runway. And with that, I can now upgrade the runway, and KSC is now entirely Tier 2. And here we have ComSat 4, the last of the satellites needed for our first generation communication system. And this particular ship has something new to show you, and that is KOS, Kerbal Operating System, where I can open up a terminal here and start running some programs. These programs are written in a language called Kerbo script and here what I have is a launch script. Now the program itself, KOS, does not come with any pre-made programs. You have to write these yourself or find them on the internet, but I am happy to say that this is one I wrote myself. This is my own landing script that I wrote um, where the uh, rocket will take off and put itself uh, not quite into orbit actually. It cuts off when it reaches the appropriate apoapsis. But what it will do is it will launch into whatever heading I provide, which is great for launching into particular inclinations. Uh, I have yet to really master the retrograde. For some reason it's still kind of flipping out, but that doesn't come up too often when you launch into a full retrograde orbit. But for other inclinations it, it launches just great. And uh, so right now I am not in control of this thing at all. I cannot control the throttle. I cannot control the heading. It is doing everything on its own uh, and to be honest this is a pretty tame program compared to most of what you see out there uh, there are people that have done some amazing things if you go out there and do a, do some searching so if you are into doing a little bit of coding on your own and would like to give this a try I uh, highly recommend it anyway the insertion of ComSat 4 went pretty much exactly the same as ComSat 3, so there's no need to show that to you. Here I am just time warping until ComSat 4 is in position, and I'll show you a little bit of a trick here. I want ComSat 4 to be exactly halfway between ComSat 1 and ComSat 2, and if you select either of those as a target, then you get the distance to those targets. So what I can do is always be examining how far am I from each of those satellites and that will help me in getting it positioned correctly. And with the last satellite finally in place it's time to examine the fruits of our labor. So here we have it. We have four satellites in that outer orbit. If I zoom out here you can see the cones of communication going out to Minmus and to the moon to cover any satellites and ships that might be going out that way. The uh, four satellites, they're all in that blue orbit, are pretty close to being equidistant, making a nice little square. You can see the lines of communication joining them up, and everything under that blue circle is now covered. Anyway, that is going to be it, and we'll see you next episode.